All right, so as I said, um, I'm Ms. Aguilar, and we're going to be discussing 2019 FRQs. Um, so we're going to do this for the, for the stream. This is our agenda. Basically, we're going to go over some current knowledge about the AP structure, tips and strategies for solving FRQs, and then some practice questions. So today we'll be doing one long FRQ and a few short ones. Um, like I said, pull up a copy of the 2019 AP Bio FRQs and follow along. Basically, for question one, you're going to be asked to interpret and evaluate experimental results. And um, you have to be able to do all of these, um, you know, bolded words that describe, identify, analyze, and so on. So we're going to be looking at um, some experimental design today and a lot, a lot of data. Um, and then the other question is dealing with a disruption to a biological phenomenon. So I think a lot about um, protein channels and um, let's see, homeostasis, enzyme um, pathways, I think of um, just anything that will, you think that is like a big pathway that if it's disrupted, um, they're asking you to like figure out what's going to happen to this pathway. So that's like the cause and effect question. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick suggestion for those of you who have, um, you're going to use your notes and your book for the test. Um, it's best if you're not too overwhelmed with information or too many notes um, because it's going to distract you a lot from taking the actual exam. So you want to make sure that you, I mean, I personally suggest maybe using a mind map or some kind of flow, flow chart that condenses all of the information for each unit and maybe having like a tab open on your device that has all the action word definitions and the formula sheet available. I'm, I'm not sure they may, they may be uh, providing that for you inside of the test itself, um, but I'm gonna get more information on that later and I'll hopefully be able to share that with you guys today on the next stream. All right, so that's my suggestions. Um, for the FRQ tips, this is what we're gonna try to follow today. Um, obviously, the AP College Board came up with a lot of tips. These are just like the summary of the most important ones, in my opinion. Um, so you can get credit for each part, A, B, C, D, E, um, independently. So you should attempt to solve each part. Even if you have to skip one, you will be okay if you answer the rest of them. Um, you want to organize your answers as clearly and neatly as possible. So uh, labeling each part A, B, C, D, et cetera. And you want to be sure to clearly label your diagrams and graphs. Um, so you include a title, X and Y axes, labels, units, a best fit line, um, and so on, okay? All right, so like I said, if you're just joining us, please pull up a 2019 FRQ copy. We will be starting shortly. Um, please feel free to ask any questions related to the topic, even if you think it's too simple or easy. I'd love to help you clarify some information in case you forgot. Um, I know everyone is at different levels, so don't be shy uh, or embarrassed. Just uh, know it's a judgment-free zone, and I am open to your questions. All right, so question one, let's go ahead. We're gonna follow this three-step strategy. Um, basically, we wanna read the question carefully. We're gonna summarize it in our own words. And then the third part is that we answer it in an organized way. So starting with part A, which obviously, like I said, if you need to skip a part, skip it and come back to it. Um, but we're gonna try to stay organized. Okay, so let's go ahead and read, read along with me for question um, actually, let me see if we're doing question one. Okay, so yeah, we are doing question one of the 2019 FRQ. So let's go ahead and start by reading the question. Um, as you can see, there's a figure that it was given to us. Personally, I like to sk skip over that first and read the question and then go back to the figure. But if you do it the other way around, it's, it's also fine. So it's your approach. Okay, number one. Uh, auxins are plant hormones that coordinate several aspects of root growth and development. Endol-3-acidic acid, known as IAA, is an auxin that is used, is usually synthesized from, amino, from the amino acid tryptophan, which is seen in figure one. Gene trypt encodes an enzyme that converts tryptophan to endol-3-pyruvic acid, 
which is called I3PA, which is then converted to IAA by an enzyme encoded by the UC gene. By the gene you, I call it UC. I don't know what you want to say. Why UC? Um, okay. So that was a lot of information. So what I like to do is I like to kind of break it down into my own words and summarize. So um, one thing I wrote was, oh, um, sorry, Sebastian, if you could just pull it up. Um, it's the 2019 FRQs. You just search in Google and you should be able to find the AP Bio 2019. Um, okay, so the first thing I wrote for my summary was um, IAA is an auxin that helps with root growth in plants, okay? It comes from tryptophan, and we're looking at an enzyme pathway, okay? That's all we need to know for now. All right, so now we're gonna start with part A. Part A asks us to circle one arrow that represents transcription on the template pathway, okay? So, and then we have to identify the molecule that would be absent if the enzyme UC is non-functional. All right, so, well, remember when we go from gene to mRNA, that's called transcription, right? When we go from DNA to the copy of DNA, which is known as messenger RNA, that's transcription. If we go from mRNA to protein, what is that process called? Yes, translation, thank you. Okay, so all it's asking for us to do is just to circle the arrow that represents transcription. So we have to circle um, the part between the gene, TRPT, and the mRNA. If you also circled the one, the arrow between the gene UC and the mRNA, that would also be correct. All right, so we're done with part of part A. So let's go to the identify the molecule that would be absent if enzyme UC is non-functional. Okay, so now we have to look at enzyme UC. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at this figure. It's a model of two enzymatic plant pathways for synthesis of IAA for tryptophan. I'm looking for the enzyme UC, so I found it over this arrow on the bottom right. And I say, okay, what's gonna happen if this enzyme UC is not working, okay? Well, if the enzyme's not working, we wouldn't see I3PA converted to IAA. So we wanna make sure that we say um, the molecule that would be absent is IAA. All right, are we looking good so far? Give me a thumbs up if you're following along, okay. All right, thank you guys. Um, for those of you, if you just joined us, we are looking at the 2019 FRQs. So you are pulling those up and we're reading along. We're on question one, part B. All right, thanks, let's move on. All right, so part B. Predict how the deletion of one pair in the fourth codon of the coding region of the gene TRPT would most likely affect the production of IAA. Justify your prediction. Okay, so now it's saying there's a deletion of one of the base pairs in the fourth codon. Um, so what I had written was, um, deletion can cause a frame shift. Um, that mutation can cause a frame shift resulting in the wrong amino acids for that protein meaning that the protein is going to be folded incorrectly. Ultimately, that's going to lead to a non-functional protein of the TRPT, which leads us to having no I3PA. Without the I3T, I3PA, we would see a reduction in IAA. So I said all of that, right? But in your test itself, you wouldn't, unless it's asking you to explain in, or describe in detail, like, you wouldn't have to write all of that. You would just ultimately say we would see a reduction in IAA. Okay. All right. So um, our prediction is the reduction of IAA or no IAA at all. Okay. And now it's asking us to justify. So now we kind of have to give the justification and say, um, the mutation would result in the translation of inactive or non-functional TRTP. So we're looking at the gene TRTP, okay? That's the DNA. If we have um, a mutation in that DNA of the gene TRTP, I'm sorry, I keep saying it wrong, TRPT, um, then we have 
um, and basically we're gonna have that um, mutation or error passed on to the mRNA. That mRNA is gonna now go to a ribosome and be translated into the enzyme TR or trip T, but it's gonna be with the wrong um, information because the codon, the frame, um, the reading frame has shifted. So now every codon may or may not code for the correct amino acid that it was originally supposed to due to that mutation. So once we have the enzyme TRTP, um, it might be non-functional. So if it's not working properly, then there's not gonna be any I3PA um, produced. And ultimately, yeah, so ultimately we're not gonna have any TRTP um, available for us. So that's more the justification. The mutation will result in the wrong protein shape and therefore no um, functional protein or no functional enzyme. Did that help? I, I had someone ask if we could elaborate on the justification. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to part C. Um, explain one feedback mechanism by which a cell could prevent production of too much IAA without limiting I3PA production. All right, so let's look at, so we wanna basically stop producing IAA, which is the very last product, but we don't wanna interrupt I3PA, okay? So what could we possibly do that would stop the, um, the enzyme uke from converting more I3PA to IAA? Okay, thank you for saying inhibiting. Um, we're gonna try to inhibit which one? Okay, so that's good. So we are gonna inhibit the uke enzyme. Um, so how could, we, how could we possibly inhibit it? Does anyone have any ideas or just uh, thoughts on it? If, if there was a way we could inhibit the uke enzyme, to prevent it from continuing, what could what could we do? There could be a competitive inhibitor um, or allosteric inhibition. Good, yeah, all of those would potentially be potential answers. I mean, not that you have to answer this. This is just my own question. Um, but what product could we use that would potentially um, trigger that it had enough IAA? So if you remember from, um, let's see, like mainly feedback loops, sometimes the product will come and inhibit the original enzyme itself. So we would see, uh, yeah, some kind of feedback inhibition like IAA could come in and stop the production um, or basically inhibit the uke enzyme so that it doesn't work anymore, okay? All right, so we are on question one, part C, um, if you are just joining us. So let's see, um, of the 2019 FRQs, uh, let's see. So negative feedback pathway. So our basically our explanation is a feedback mechanism that would prevent, um, we're looking for a feedback mechanism that would prevent too much IAA. So we would say some kind of negative feedback you could say feedback inhibition or um, basically something that inhibits the pathway for IAA. Um, you could say the uke enzyme is inhibited or the uke enzyme activity is inhibited. So, or the, I didn't see this one before, but the production of the uke enzyme itself. So maybe you could put some kind of stop on the mRNA that makes the enzyme uke and you would not have a functional uke to continue working on um, this process of, you know, making more IAA. Okay, so those would be um, good answers. Yes, exactly. They would act, um, the, the IAA could potentially act as a repressor um, for the um, uke enzyme. Okay, so part D and E are not things that we covered in, in this course um, this year. So we're gonna go ahead and skip that. Are there any other questions about question one before we move on to the next part? All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. Um, 
So we're going to go ahead and jump to question three. Um, we're going to read the question. We're going to summarize it in our own words, and then we're going to try to answer parts A, B, and C. All right, question three of 2019 FRQs. Go ahead and find that. Get ready. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read question three. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, known as PDC, catalyzes the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, a substrate from the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. The rate of pyruvate conversion is greatly reduced in individuals with PDC deficiency, a rare disorder. This kind of reminds me of something that they might ask you for the second question, right? They're basically saying there's some kind of disorder that this a person can carry, and it basically doesn't allow them to convert um, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, all right? So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to, um, we read the question, so let's summarize the question in our own words. Um, in my own words, I'm going to say the question is saying, PDC converts pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which is found in the Krebs cycle, and that's it, okay? <clears throat> All right, and then we're going to actually start with the questions. So um, question A is asking, identify the cellular location where PDC is most active. So if we remember, and maybe some of you covered this, maybe you all didn't, I don't, I don't know, but um, if PDC catalyzes the conversion of pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, you would have to say, okay, where's the Krebs cycle? It says a substrate from the Krebs cycle. So you need to say, where is this Krebs cycle taking place? So do you guys remember where the Krebs cycle takes place? In which organelle, more specifically? Yes, it's, on, it's in the mitochondria. Thank you, guys. And the answer is right there, too. <laughs> in case you didn't know that. Um, but yeah, the, the, Krebs play, the Krebs cycle takes place in the mitochondria. So the Krebs is um, going to be part of the process of cellular respiration. Okay, so for those of you who may not remember all of the details, I'm just going to go over it real quickly. We have this thing called cellular respiration, right? Cellular respiration is where we are basically... Um, the first thing we're doing is we're breaking down sugars, okay, through glycolysis, okay, and we're using that that um, the energy from the food that we eat and whatnot, all those sugars, we're going to break them down and we're going to make ATP, okay. So the first part is glycolysis, the second part is uh, the Krebs cycle, and the last thing that they do in the process is the electron transport chain, which is where we see ATP synthase working to make ATP. Remember that both plants and animals and other organisms break down sugar to make ATP energy for the cells to do work. Okay, so um, it's not just animals. I know at this level, some of you, most of you probably know that, but sometimes um, plants, people don't remember that plants actually do cellular respiration as well. Okay, all that to say, let's answer the question. <laughs> Okay, so we got it. It should be the mitochondria or the mitochondrial matrix. All right, so let's move on to part B. Make a claim about how PDC affects the amounts of NADH produced by glycolysis and the amount of NADH produced by the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. All right, so, and then we have to provide reasoning to support our claims and so on. So if you guys... Um, Remember, what is uh, NADH in your, in, in just, yeah, it's an electron carrier. Exactly. Okay. So um, are we going to need an electron carrier in glycolysis? Excuse me for just a sec. I got to close the door. Okay. I'm back. Um, so we don't need an electron carrier in the process of glycolysis. Um, honestly, that's kind of a tough question, yeah, because it's kind of requiring you to memorize parts of that, and I don't really necessarily agree with memorizing it like that, but um, it is what it is. So, no, we don't need uh, the electron carriers in glycolysis, um, but so that, therefore our answer would be 
Uh, glycolysis will not will have no change because it doesn't need the PDC uh, enzyme, and the Krebs cycle will need the PDC enzyme, so we will see a decrease in NADH. Okay. So let's look at the scoring guidelines just to help us out. Um, so it does tell us glycolysis occurs before conversion of pyruvic to acetyl CoA, so there's going to be no change. That's going to be our claim, no change to glycolysis. Um, then we would say for our claim for the Krebs cycle, it's going to decrease. Um, and then we would say that the Krebs cycle occurs after conversion of pyruvic to acetyl-CoA and NADH is going to be affected. Okay. Exactly. Brandon says glycolysis doesn't rely on PDC, so deficiency doesn't matter. All right, perfect. Um, let's continue to the next part, part C. This is a genetics part. So it's asking us if um, PDC deficiency is caused by the mutation in the PDHA1 gene, which is located on the X chromosome. So now it's telling us it's X linked. Okay, so now when we think of Punnett squares, there's like basic monohybrid cross, there is um, a dihybrid cross, and then there's like the um, co-dominance, do um, incomplete dominance. So there's all kinds of different um, exceptions to Mendel's rules. So this is gonna be the X-linked one. Um, so a male with PDC deficiency and a homozygous, okay, homo means same. So we're gonna say she's uh, same uh, alleles, okay female with no family history of PDC. So she's going to be considered the normal um, one. Uh, she's going to mate and they're going to have some male offspring, right? So it's saying calculate the probability that the male offspring will have PDC deficiency. So let's look at my Punnett square. I just, I was sketching some notes and this is very sloppy, but I think it will help if you understand it. So if you look at my little picture on the power on the Google slides, you'll see, um, yeah, there is a 0% chance, but let's go ahead and discuss why. Um, so the way I did it is X, Y, it represents the male, X, X represents female. And the um, X, Y, we're gonna put, so we can, we can make a key, right? We can say um, R, like you can choose any letter, honestly, but I'm gonna just say the big R, capital R, represents no deficiency or the normal. Uh, little r represents that they have the, this, this disorder, or the deficiency. Um, and then for the male, he's gonna, he's gonna mate and he's gonna have it, right? So he's a carrier. Um, and then the female, however, would carry two normal alleles. Okay, with big R. And then if you just look at the males only, they both receive their um, their normal allele from their mom because they got the X chromosome from their mother, not from their father in this case, um, because it's a male. If it was a female, they would have gotten one X from their dad and one X from their mom. Okay, so there's a 0% chance that this male off, their male offspring will have this disorder. All right, any questions about question three so far? All right, let's move on to the next question. What is the next question? <laughs> okay, question six, let's see. Okay, actually, let's skip through question six for now. Let's go to question seven. And then we'll come back to question six if we have time at the very end, uh, which it looks like we will. All right, so everyone get to question seven, please. Um, we're gonna do the same process we've been doing So I'm gonna go ahead and read you the question. You guys can follow along. 
Um, and remember, we're kind of going to try to summarize this question in our own words. So researchers studying patterns of gene expression in mice. The researcher collected samples from six different tissues in a, in a healthy mouse and measured the amount of mRNA from six genes. The data are shown in figure one, and it shows us mRNA expression levels. All right, so my summary is going to be pretty much what they said. <laughs> Basically, if someone is studying gene expression. Uh, they looked at some tissues from mice, and they found the amount of mRNA that is present in each of these genes, um, in, each, in each of the tissues. Okay, so let's go ahead and read part A. So part A is um, based on the data provide, provided, identify the gene in, that is most likely to encode a protein that is essential component of glycolysis. Provide reasoning for your support or for to support your identification. All right, so now we're gonna look at the chart, right? We're gonna say this is mRNA expression levels of six genes. All right, if we look at gene E at the very top, we see that it's active in high, there's high amounts of the messenger RNA in the liver, the heart, and the brain. And the rest of them don't have any mRNA, okay? That's no mRNA, which is the, the, the white part. Um, if we look at gene F, we see that there's a high amount of F mRNA in the liver and in the brain. We see a moderate amount of mRNA in the heart and the kidneys and no mRNA in the pancreas or skeletal muscles. All right, so I'm just trying to show you how I would break it down. Um, but if we go on to Gene G, this will be the last one I actually do with you. We're gonna see Gene G has a lot of mRNA in the liver. There's a moderate amount of mRNA in the heart. There's a lot of mRNA in the brain. Um, there's some in the kidneys, the pancreas, and a lot in the muscles, in the skeletal muscles. Okay, so we're trying to find the gene that um, that's most likely to encode an essential component of glycolysis. Well, all living, all cells, right? Oh, sorry, we are on, let me see, question... Seven, I skipped question six for now, we'll come back to it. Let me go forward on my slides. Okay, so question seven is say basically, um, it's asking us to identify the gene. So that's most likely gonna encode an essential component of glycolysis. So since glycolysis has to occur in every single um, cell, right? Because every single cell needs energy, we're gonna need to see that the protein is gonna be transcribed and made into mRNA in every, every single um, tissue, okay? So the only one that has mRNA present in every single tissue is actually gene G. Provide reasoning to support your identification. So let's see, based on that, that was my reasoning. The identification is just saying gene G. The reasoning is that um, gene G is only expressed in all six tissues and glycolysis must occur in all six tissues because um, glycolysis is an essential component to the uh, component to the cell making energy. All right, let's uh, talk about question seven, part B. The researcher observed the tissues with high level of gene H, mRNA, did not always have the gene H protein. Okay, so this is something completely different. So now we're looking at gene H. We're, we're seeing that um, it just didn't have, even though gene H had a lot of um, transcription occurring, there wasn't much translation occurring. So it's asking us why it's asking us to provide reasoning to explain how the tissues with high gene H mRNA levels can have no gene H protein. So, um, does anyone remember 
how that could be possible. Okay, um, so I'm asking you guys, this one, we're, we're looking at question seven, part B. It's saying that we're seeing that um, gene H has a lot of um, mRNA, but they don't have the protein. So why is it that we can have some mRNA like floating around, but no protein is actually being made from it? Transcription is happening, but translation isn't. That's correct. Um, okay, so yes, they are controlled by operons in bacteria. So gene expression is controlled by operons in bacteria. However, um, we have eukaryotic um, control mechanisms, and we're looking at mice in this one. So we would have to have some kind of a eukaryotic um, mRNA control. So there are things that basically um, stop the mRNA from um, being made into a protein. So let's see if we can figure um, what those things are. So there's this thing called RNA interference. Okay, so we have some kind of um, protein that attaches to the mRNA that doesn't allow for translation. Okay, and in this case, it's not even asking you to specifically name any process. So basically, you would just say there's the mRNA is not being um, it's not being translated because it's being blocked by something else. There's some kind of interference. Um, you could say that maybe the mRNA didn't make it out of the nucleus and therefore it's not being translated um, or because of post-transcriptional modifications. All right, let's see what we got. Let me see, I'm trying to catch up on your guys' chat. So an inhibitor is binding to the protein. Um, it's not a protein at this point, it's just the messenger RNA, but it is something like an inhibitor that can block um, the mRNA from being made. What are the proteins? So. Um, I would have to look that up because I rem I know that I covered this for sure with my students, but I don't remember. There's like at least four ways um, that there are transcriptional controls. MicroRNA is one of them. Uh, so microRNA does block the transcription. There's other um, there's other ways to have translational control. So if you look up Anastasia, look up translational control in your biology book you might find at least four different mechanisms. Oh, look, thank you. Perfect. Gene regulation in eukaryotes. Yes, that is a thing you should look through. Um, let me actually open it so we can talk about it real quick. You guys are the best. Thanks for helping me out. Okay. Uh, MicroRNAs, alternative splicing. Let's see, what else? Um, Okay, yeah, these are the things. Small regulatory RNAs can control mRNA lifespan and translation. MicroRNAs were among the first regulatory RNAs to be discovered. This is all from Khan Academy. Um, so yeah, basically the microRNA stops translation from occurring um, and it doesn't allow translation to occur. Okay, I think that's that's what we'll we'll stop there for now. But there's lots of different ways um, you can control translation. And the crazy part is, you know, you don't even have to. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean we'll stop there. We're, I mean, technically, I'll be here for 20 more minutes. If you need to leave, you can. But um, I meant we'll stop talking about this topic for now. But yeah, basically, uh, transcription. Um, they didn't ask you to name that though. So they're not even asking you to name the micro RNAs or anything. If you did, that'd be even more specific and that's awesome. But if not, you can just say, well, some kind of, something's blocking translation. They're, it's not allowing it to happen. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, I want to continue on to question A. And like I said, we'll revisit the other, the other questions uh, shortly. All right, so let's read question eight together. We're gonna summarize it in our own words and then we're gonna answer the parts. Question eight, um, it's giving us some kind of um, diagram or model, okay? 
And then we're gonna go ahead and read the question first. So I'm assuming it starts here. The petal co color of the Mexican morning glory uh, changes from red to blue and the petals uh, the petal cells swell during flower opening. The pigment heavenly, heavenly blue anthocyanine is found in the vacuole of petal cells. Petal color is determined by pH of the vacuole. Okay, that is what I would be summarizing. Everything else I gave you is meh. Um, petal color is determined by pH of the vacuole. A model of morning glory petal cell before and after opening is shown in table one. All right, so now I'm gonna look um, at part A. Identify the cellular component in the model that is responsible for the increase of pH of the vacuole during flower opening and describe the component's role in changing the pH of the vacuole. Okay, so um, we're looking, let's look at the model. Um, we see it in the very beginning when it's a bud, so we're looking at changes in morning glory petal cells during flower opening. In the very first box, you see the bud, that's the model. The vacuole pH is 6.6, .6, the flower color is red, and the cell volume is small, okay? When we see the flower open, we notice that the vacuole pH increases to 7.7, .7, okay? Um, which means it's becoming more basic and we see it turn the flower color to blue and there's a large volume um, within the cell. All right, so, all right. So the, um, the negative log formula, you just kind of need to know about hydrogens. You, I don't, I think it said it was beyond the scope of the um, class to actually use that formula and we don't, we don't need that. Um, okay, so, there was a debate amongst some of the AP bio teachers. I followed them on the AP bio Facebook group, which is kind of funny, but <laughs> yeah. So basically they're, they're predicting that they, they may have you calculate some statistics, um, but more so they're interested in a lot of the teachers were emphasizing trying to be prepared as far as just understanding the statistics, um, not necessarily, doing all of them. But chi-square, if they give you almost all of the information, it's not that bad to actually complete. So you should be familiar with chi-squared for sure. Um, all right, but going back to this question. So um, we have to first identify the cellular component that's responsible for increasing the pH. So it looks like that's going to be um, the the um this pump right here the k plus h plus transport protein when it's active um so let's check oh yeah so it's the k plus h plus transport protein um and describe now this is the second part of question a describe the components role in changing the ph of the vacuole so what is happening what what is happening to the hydrogen ions inside of the vacuole are they increasing or decreasing inside of the vacuole it's pumping hydrogen out of the vacuole that's correct so um yeah the hydrogen ions are decreasing inside of the vacuole and we're seeing more of the um potassium going in or the k plus all right so the K plus is making it more basic. The H plus is um, acidic. So when it's been pumped out, the acidity um, increases, I mean, the acidity portion decreases, but the pH overall is increasing. All right, part B. A researcher claims that the activation of the K plus H plus transport protein causes the vacuole to swell with water. Provide reasoning to support the researcher's claim. Okay, so now it's saying um, because we have more ions in the vacuole, what's going to happen with the water? Where will the water go? So water is going to, yeah, so water is going to flow inside of the vacuole once um, there's more ions in there. Okay, yeah, so water is going to flow to the place to where there's more sol solute 
so that it can dilute the solutes and make them um, a little more evenly dispersed through the process of osmosis. Good. All right, perfect. So it looks like you guys are getting that so far. Um, are there any questions? The reasoning was basically the solute is moving, um, the solute potassium is moving into the vacuole, making the making um, water follow it. So basically through osmosis, water will move into the vacuole. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back to question. Which question was it? Let me see. I have to look at my notes. <clears throat> okay, we did question one and three. I think we skipped question six. All right. Oh, thanks, guys. All right, so let's go back to question six and um, figure it out. This one's a little bit more extensive, and it might take us a little longer. So hopefully um, this will be the last. This is going to be the last question that we do. Um, we'll take it kind of slowly. Okay. All right, so like I said, question six is giving us a table again, but we don't necessarily need to read it right away. I like to skip over that for now and come back to it. Um, so let me go ahead and read you the question six of 2019 FRQs. Um, it says the yeast, I'm not even gonna try um, to pronounce this because you don't need to. On the test, you wanna save as much time as possible. So just keep it simple in your head, even if you make up little abbreviations for the yeast. So I can say the yeast or the name of these organisms, in, in which case this is yeast. So the yeast SC is a single-celled organism. Amino acid synthesis, amino acid synthesis, so they're making amino acid in yeast cells occurs in through the metabolic pathway, okay? Good to know. And enzymes in the synthesis pathways are encoded by different genes. Okay, so basically we're looking, so far we're looking at some genes code for proteins or enzymes that are needed to make amino acids. All right. The synthesis of a particular amino acid, so making a particular amino acid can be prevented by mutation of a gene encoding an enzyme in the required pathway. All right, so now we're, we're gonna basically, um, we kind of summarized the question. We said enzymes need to be made by different genes. These enzymes control the pathway to make amino acids that the yeast cells need. Okay, so if you didn't know, yeast are a form of fungi and they are eukaryotic. Um, so they're gonna be more, closely related to us than they are to um, bacteria. Um, all right, so the synthesis of a particular amino acid can be prevented by mutation. So what they're doing now is they're mutating a gene that is required um, for the to make an enzyme that's required for the pathway to make these amino acids. All right, so now that we got that, let's continue reading the question. A researcher conducted an experiment to determine the ability of yeast to grow on media that differ in amino acid content. Yeast can grow as both haploid and diploid cells. The researcher tested two different haploid yeast strains, mutant one and mutant two, each of which have single recessive mutations. Okay, so they have one recessive mutation in their allele and a haploid wild type strain. The resulting data is shown in table one. All right, so we'll look at table one in just a moment, but it's asking us to identify the role of treatment one in the experiment. All right, so, oh yeah, thanks guys. It, you guys are helping me out. Um, I just, sometimes I start reading the chat and then I, I got lost in my moment, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, the identification for the control is gonna be um, treatment one, okay? And in this case, it's considered a positive control. And I don't know if any of you know the difference. I will actually probably, I don't think I went over this with my students, but we have talked through the FRQ practice about negative controls. Um, a control is basically whatever gets the normal treatment. Um, a negative control is when you are not expecting, um, you're not like testing for a result. And a positive control, you are gonna have um, 
some kind of result. So in this case, they put all the amino acids and they're testing that the yeast are actually growing. So they're basically testing for yeast growth. And so that's why it's positive control. If it was a negative control, they would have no amino acids present um, and that would be the negative control because then they would say no yeast are really growing. But in order to kind of make sense of this, they, they did all amino acids present. It's a, it's a um, positive control. All right. Yes, there can be more. They, yes, there can be two controls and um, we usually, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you guys did the enzyme um, lab, but there were two controls in that one a long time ago. Um, so maybe you can check your notes back on that. Um, but yeah, it's possible. It's just not, it's not, I don't recommend it because it gets very confusing, but obviously in real, real science, they have to use multiple things that they're testing at times. All right, so let's continue um, to the next part. So we already got the identification. We said treatment one is the um, control. Provide reasoning to explain how mutant one can grow on treatment. Um, uh, provide reasoning. So now we have to provide reasoning for, um, let's see. I'm sorry, guys, I'm on the wrong question, so. Okay, provide reasoning to explain how mutant one can grow on treatment one medium, but cannot grow on tr treatment three. So mutant one on treatment one, but not on treatment three. So we see that like the difference is that it has a negative when all amino acids are present except methionine. So let's see if that can help us out. Um, so mutant one can use methionine when it's present, but apparently it cannot make its own methionine. So that would be the reasoning to why um, mutant one can grow on treatment one, but not on treatment three. So uh, yeah, I don't know if some of you guys know this, but um, you know, we have 20 amino acids in our body. Um, some of them, yes, it does serve, methionine does serve as a start codon, um, but it can be found in different parts of the um, um, protein as well. But anyway, um, we have different amino acids and some of the essential amino acids that we need, we make, and some of them we have to get from our nutrition, like eating um, fruits and vegetables and whatnot. So we steal amino acids from other living organisms. So um, same thing here, I guess the bacteria or the yeast, uh, sorry, not bacteria, the yeast in this situation is, um, is using methionine, but it cannot make its own methionine. All right, so let's move on to the next thing. Um, part C. Yeast made by fusing two haploid cells to make a diploid cell. In the second experiment, the researcher made mutant one and two haploid strains to produce a diploid cells. Using the table provided, predict whether diploids will grow on each of the four media using plus or minus signs to indicate no growth. All right, so what they did is they basically, um, remember that each mutant had one functional allele and one um, mutant allele. Okay, so when they combined both of them, we're assuming that they got two alleles that were functional and that they're gonna be able to um, function in all, all four treatment areas. Okay, so then we would put a plus sign for each area on the column. Okay, let me go over it real quick. Uh, we, we, we have five minutes, so I think we'll be okay. Yeah, so let's go over it one more time. So. Basically, um, they're fusing to, um, let's see, let me read it correctly to make sure. The researcher tested two different haploid yeast strains from mutant one and two, okay? Um, and if you guys look, at, let's look at the mutant one strains, okay? Mutant one, when all amino acids um, are present, it indicates that the yeast can grow. So mutant one can grow when all of them are present. If no amino acids are present, then it cannot grow. Um, 
if in mutant one and treatment three, um, it does not grow if methionine is, is not there. Um, and then in treatment four, um, it can grow without leucine, okay? So now let's look at mutant two. Mutant two has a, um, all amino acids present, it can grow. Um, when no amino acids are present, it cannot grow. Um, if all amino acids are present except methionine, it can still grow. And if in mutant two treatment four, if all amino acids are present except for leucine, we have um, the strain will not grow for mutant two. Now, if we were to fuse uh, mutant one and two, remember they still have one um, allele that could be encoded for um, that's not mutated basically. So they basically um, combine them and then they can um, kind of cover each other for the parts that they were missing before. Let's look at the chart again. So mutant two can not, or mutant two can grow um, in treatment three um, because apparently if it says all for treatment three, all amino acids are present except methionine. So apparently mutant two, it doesn't, it doesn't need methionine from the environment because it can make it itself. And does that help Anastasia? I'm sorry, is it Anastasia or Anastasia? I don't know. Okay. All right, so um, let's make sure we answered all the sections. We did answer part A, B, and C. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's just asking you to predict that there will be growth in all four cells um, of the fourth column, um, but it's not asking you to justify why, okay? All right, guys, so... Um, Let's see, so sorry, why is treatment two positive again? Let's look at treatment two. Treatment two is negative for both mutant strains. Oh, I see why you're saying it's positive. That's a great question. Um, I'm assuming that they're able, I mean, that is such a good question. I actually don't know. Um, maybe I can get back to you guys on that um, because I'm wondering if they both did not succeed in that treatment, why is it still positive? Um, the only justification I can say is maybe they have the alleles that are able to um, to function just like similar to the wild type because the wild type was able to um, to make all of its amino acids. So together, since this one can function with uh, leucine, um, mutant one can basically function without leucine. So mutant one can make its own leucine. Um, mutant two can make its own methionine or cannot, oh yeah, can still make its own methionine. So together, um, they're going to be able to make leucine and methionine, which is means that they don't need any of the amino acids present to still function. That's what I'm assuming. Okay. All right, good. <laughs> oh, it was a huge debate in your class. Oh, good. That actually helps me feel better. Oh, you guys are so sweet. Okay, awesome. I'm glad we kind of settled that. And thank you guys so much. That's the end of my time here. So um, again, good luck with the AP exam. Um, I'll see you guys at five o'clock if you guys can make it or eight o'clock Eastern time. Um, thanks for your time today. Good job, guys. Bye.